All right, I want to start talking today about uh, how World War I got started and maybe, maybe a little bit more why it got started, why it turned into a world war as opposed to a more localized conflict. And so uh, just to give you a, a little preview, uh, I am going to spend a little bit of time on, on the classic root causes of the war. These are in every textbook. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time here, though, um, and, and some things that, that uh, talk about Europe's stability in the years before World War I broke out. Got to spend a little bit of time, of course, on the trigger. Uh, literally, Gavrilo <laughs> pulled the trigger. But then, you know, why? Why do we go to a world war? And we'll, uh, we're going to try and cover all that. So I got to start here with the root causes, and I really don't want to spend a lot of time here because I've already done this on, in my PowerPoint, and uh, this is something that it's kind of covered all over the place. So as, as we look at these things, I think one thing stands out, though, and that is uh, this, this sense of rivalry, the, the rivalry between uh, the great powers is at dangerous levels. Um, and we, we can pick apart each one of these, but again, I, I, I have limited camera time. I want to move on, but the rivalry between the great powers is at dangerous levels. Um, and we can, we can look a little closely at that. Uh, France and Germany uh, have been hostile to each other since the Franco-Prussian War, and um, that would be 1870, and then the Declaration of the German Empire, 1871. They've been hostile. They have almost come to blows over various uh, colonial um, frictions that developed the Moroccan crises, the Moroccan crisis, the Agadir crisis. These are, these are times where uh, France and Germany almost came to blows. And France is desperately trying to undo what the Germans did to them in 1870. And they're desperately trying to seek alliances uh, because they fear uh, German military power. And the Germans, for their part, have been, uh, on the one hand, trying to keep France isolated, which Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, did a great job of that. Uh, but uh, Wilhelm II, eh, not such a good job at keeping France isolated because he's so determined to wage his own kind of ham-handed diplomacy. And he's going to be left with really only one good friend, and that's uh, Austria-Hungary. And, and at the same time, uh, the British, who have pretty well ignored the rise of Germany, are now going to be drawn in toward France, who historically, Britain and France have fought many, many, many conflicts, but now they're going to be drawn toward France against Germany because Wilhelm II insists on competing with the British at sea. I'm going to build a battleship navy that's bigger and better than yours. And Britannia is feeling a little threatened. Um, if we look to the east, we see Russia and the Austrian, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, in direct competition for uh, influence in the Balkans. And that would be, you know, the, like Bulgaria and Bosnia and Serbia. And the Russians have their own variety of Russian nationalism, but they have a super nationalism too, pan-Slavism. And they're claiming to be the representative and big brother of all the Slavic peoples. And some of those Slavic peoples just happen to be under the thumb of the Habsburg emperors of Austria-Hungary. So we see a rivalry there, too. And all these countries have massive military establishments. They're, they're ready to go to war at any time. Uh, and the lessons of the Napoleonic era in terms of mass conscription and uh, basically training every generation, every man a soldier, these lessons have been well learned 
and all the countries are prepared to mobilize massive military forces. All right, so let's, let's get past that. This is in every textbook, and I think it's pretty well covered. I know I cover it in my PowerPoint. Let's look at some deeper things. And, you know, I've got four things here. I could have put more, but I like these four for things that are really destabilizing Europe. Europe, after 1815, has a long season of peace. Uh, when I say peace, not total absence of war, but not a general war. Nothing like the Napoleonic Wars where basically everybody's piling in. So what upsets that? I think the number one most important thing is the rise of Germany as a powerful state. And Germany had been divided for so long, and the German-speaking Austrians went one way and formed a multinational empire. And Prussia, the other leading German state, is going to be the one that gathers the smaller German states and unifies them. This is not on the unification of Germany, so I don't want to go too far afield, but uh, the rise of Germany is going to really upset the balance of power. Germany is going to uh, emerge as stronger than the Austro Austrian or Austro-Hungarian Empire. They're going to emerge as stronger than France, and in terms of their industry, by 1900, they're clearly stronger than Britain, who were the early leaders in industrialization. Uh, and Germany's powerfully nationalistic. So Germany is, is kind of this 400-pound uh, gorilla in the room. And this is, uh, this is something that cannot be ignored. The rise of Germany really uh, is going to upset the balance of power. The decline of the Ottoman Empire... I think uh, is a number two in terms of things that are destabilizing Europe. Uh, the Ottomans, of course, pushed into Europe. They were the all-conquering Turks in the 1500s, but uh, they, they kind of fell on hard times at the end of the 1600s. By the year 1700, they've been run out of Hungary, and they're clearly in decline militarily. But they hold on for a long time, partly because the other great powers can't agree on who should take the biggest, choicest uh, bits of the spoils. If the Ottoman Empire is going to collapse, who gets to pick up the pieces? Since they can't agree, it's just safer to let the Ottomans continue. This is sometimes called the Eastern Question. You know, what are we going to do about the decline of the Ottoman Empire? And as they decline, uh, it takes a while, but eventually the nations of the Balkan Peninsula start to gain their independence, starting with uh, Serbia becoming kind of autonomous, 1830, Greece fully independent, 1832. There's going to be, uh, going to be wars and rumors of wars down in the Balkans. And leading the charge would be Tsarist Russia the arch enemy of the Ottomans, and they would uh, be so successful uh, in several bloody conflicts that they're in position to basically dominate the Balkans and dominate the Straits leading from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. Okay, Britain does not want to see a powerful Russian naval force in the Eastern Mediterranean. And nobody's sure that they want the Russians to be able to pick up uh, all the spoils of the Ottoman decline. So the Russians are going to be blocked. They're blocked by uh, British and French participation in the Crimean War, 1853-56. They are blocked again, 1877 and 78, the Russo-Turkish War. Uh, they win that war with a little help from their little friends, um, Romania, Bulgaria, and Serbia, these countries send a lot of troops. They fight hard, but they're blocked. The Congress of Berlin in 1878 basically overturns the Russian peace settlement. So we have the Ottomans in decline, but the Russians are not allowed to pick up the pieces. Instead, this is just part of the rising rivalry. Um, and Russia itself is not in good shape as we go into the second half of the century. Russia is really struggling. They emancipated 
the serfs, 1861, uh, turns out losing the Crimean War was a major wake-up call for Russia, and they start a process of reform and industrialization. And it's also going to put a lot of strain on the whole czarist system as they industrialize and urbanize in fast motion. And eventually, the czarist government can't take it. Uh, when we get to the year 1905, and Russia goes to war with Japan, and Japan defeats Russia. No one expected Japan to be able to defeat a European power, but defeat them they did. And all the, uh, all the social strain, all the agitation that we're seeing in Russia really boils over in 1905. And the Tsarist government manages to keep the lid on things just barely. Just barely. They, they, we came very close to overthrowing the Tsarist system in 1905. So Russia is, is also having serious problems and many of their nationalities are yearning to be free and are participating in the radicalism that's beginning to shred the Tsarist empire. And finally we get to the decline of Austria. Austria is sitting at the center of Europe. Uh, it is just a hodgepodge of nationalities. The name gives it away. Austro-Hungarian Empire, what does that even mean? Um, and that leaves out the Czechs and the Slovaks and the Romanians and the Serbians. And so as we get into the early part of the 1900s, we have um, independent countries that want the people of their nation to be inside of their nation. Serbs want to be part of Serbia. And Romanians want to be part of Romania, but there in the middle of Europe sits the multinational Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it's a barrier to the unification of these other peoples, and they're not happy about it. Which brings us to what happened in the summer of 1914. June 28th, Archduck Franz Ferdinand goes to Sarajevo. Why is he there on the 28th of June, a Serb Holiday. Why is he in Sarajevo? You know, he was known for being bullheaded. He went and did it. He goes there. He ignores bombs under his car that blow up the car behind him. Uh, he doesn't get the heck out of town. Europe could have been very different. And a lot of things about Europe were gradually improving. You know, Europe is slowly becoming more democratic in the early 1900s. Uh, even in Russia, there's a very minimal sense of constitutionalism. So Europe is kind of going in good directions generally, but it all comes to an end. It all comes to an end. And along with the death of the Archduke is going to be the death of old Europe. The death of Europe's confidence in the future. The death of European world power. Now, today, people look at that and they think, maybe that's not a bad thing. You know, but uh, for all their flaws, Europe had brought a lot of civilizing and modernizing influences to the world as well. So I know that's not popular to think about, but I think it has to be considered. And let's consider the results for a second. If we go forward to the end of the war, what do we get out of it? Uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, Stalin, and uh, his regime in the Soviet Union. There's really not a whole lot of good that comes out of World War I. I guess the United States becomes the most uh, powerful nation on earth, but again, uh, aside from my American perspective, I can't say there's a lot of good coming out of World War I. Except maybe one other thing. Maybe one other thing is good. Before World War I, war was considered a viable option in diplomacy. You know, if I can sit down with you and work things out, maybe that's great. Or if I can bully you and force you to agree to things, that's great too. But if you won't agree, if I can't convince you and I can't intimidate you, well, I can just fight you. I can just beat you down, take what I want. And war had always been considered, as Klaus Lutz put it, politics by other means. Well, not anymore. In the modern world, today, Warfare is considered a last resort. It's really only ethical if you've been attacked. So why do we go to war? Well, a Serbian terrorist 
shot the heir to the throne of a struggling Austro-Hungarian Empire. This has to be answered. This has to be answered. I don't see how Austria survives, honestly, if they don't go to war. If they don't do something to show, look, we're not going to let you guys do that. I think it's almost an existential threat that a Serb terrorist, with the probable connivance of, of uh, Serb intelligence and security forces, had shot the heir to the throne of Austria. Austria has to do something about it. Russia has a role here. And Russia gets a pass because we're just so fascinated with what happens next in Russia, which is the Bolshevik Revolution. But Russia has a role here. Russia contacts Serbia and says, don't worry, little buddy. And then they proceeded to mobilize. Now, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around this, but back then, mobilization was like pushing the button. Once you started that process, you could not easily stop it. And if the Russians mobilize, the Germans have very little choice but to mobilize. If the Germans do not mobilize, then they're basically just sitting ducks. And in a world where war is an option, how can you afford to not mobilize if your neighbor does? Russia plays a big role here. They always get a pass. Germany gets blamed. Germany deserves a lot of blame, but I don't think Russia deserves a pass. Germany. Well, let's start blaming Germany. First of all, they tell Austria, you know what? No matter what you do, we got your back. No matter how far you decide to push this, we will support you all the way. Why on earth does the most powerful state in Europe tie its fortunes to one of the weakest? If there's one thing the war proves, it's Austria is no longer really a great power, not militarily. And Germany tied their fortunes to the weaker partner. The bully allowed the toady to make the decision. That was a big, big mistake. They should never have done it, but it's kind of typical for the style of diplomacy that Wilhelm II uh, believed in. The Schlieffen plan. Poor General von Schlieffen. It wasn't really his plan to do this at all. He certainly never planned on fighting Russia and France at the same time. But that is the situation that Germany found itself in. The Russians have mobilized, so now it's time to go to war. Why do the Germans feel like they must go to war? Well, I've already explained, they got to mobilize. That's going to threaten France. France is going to have to mobilize. So Germany now feels pressure to act while they still can. If Russia is mobilized and France mobilizes on the other side, the Germany can be crushed in the middle. Germany must move fast. And so the decision is an easy one. You hit the faster, more dangerous opponent. And in the German judgment, the faster, more dangerous opponent is France. So Germany is going to have to put their war plan into execution and they're going to have to invade France. On the way through invading France, the Germans march through Belgium. And the British, who have been on the sidelines, say, I say, old man, you can't just do that. You have a treaty with Belgium. How, how can you do that? And the Germans infamously answered, a treaty is just a piece of paper. And then on the way through, they also managed to commit some atrocities. That's going to bring Britain into the war as well. Have we left any of the great powers out? I guess Italy's still standing on the sidelines, but uh, they will get into it as a result of their own greed. And that brings me finally to America's involvement, uh, actually toward the end here. Uh, Germany grew desperate to win the war because nothing was working, which is another story of the war. Uh, and so they unleashed their submarines. Unrestricted submarine warfare, sinking without warning. Let the passengers fend for themselves on the open seas. And this is something that President Wilson had warned Germany against after the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915. Any more like that, and the United States might be joining this war against you. And the Germans basically are desperate now in 1917, and they 
they basically say, look, we got to do what it takes to win. And we got to starve Britain out. The submarines are off the leash. But nothing explains why they contacted Mexico with the Zimmerman telegram. Hey, Mexico, how would you like to help defeat the United States since maybe they're going to join the war and we can help you get some territory back that the United States took from you in the Mexican War? How would that be? I don't know what on earth the Germans were thinking, except that it again is an example of their ham-handed diplomacy. I don't know how much help they think that a... Was Mexico even a third-rate power in 1917? I don't know how much help they thought Mexico would be. But this is going to pull the United States in. Is it a world war in the sense of being fought everywhere on the globe? Eh, maybe not exactly. Is it a world war in the sense of it pulled in almost all the great powers of the world? Yes. On the far side of the, of the world, even Japan got involved in uh, basically aggrandizing themselves and grabbing, grabbing some uh, small island chains that they want. So in that sense, it really is a world war. And the people who fight in it come from all over the world, uh, especially the British and the French draw from their colonial troops. Colonial armies clash in Africa. And eventually, eventually toward the end, when it's very clear that the Germans are going to lose, a whole bunch of countries that had not been involved at all join the Allies because, hey, better get a piece of the pie while you still can. So this is a war that changed the world. And in a lot of ways, not for the better. Um, although, the idea that maybe war is not such a great idea is certainly not a first re resort, I think is a, a good legacy of World War I. All right, thanks a lot. See you next time.